perhaps I can ask, well, Reiner, first, um, last off, first on. Um, in about a year's time, Indonesia will hold more elections for president and for parliament. So what will be the most likely scenario after these elections, do you think, and how that'll affect Australian export markets? I believe um, the, the most immediate consequence is that I am not very optimistic about Indonesia, Australia, uh, SIPA uh, agreement. The, the thing is, it's not just only next year parliamentary and presidential elections. This year we have local elections in lots of uh, provinces and districts. So the whole country is already in election mood. And free trade is such a difficult topic that usually for a politician you can only lose rather than win. So I don't believe he will invest political capital at the moment to actually pull this through. So that, I think, will be a first and immediate consequence. Then the president does very well in polling, but he did last time, and his opponent last time in 2014 caught up very fast and almost won against the president. They are going to pair again in 2019, um, so we have to wait how this ends up. But uh, if the president wins, then I believe we will see a rather stable government, and I believe also there is then room for a free trade agreement. Well, I have some more questions for the panel, but I, I do see somebody wanting to ask a question. Will you state your name and your organisation, please? Sure. My name is Han Xiong Xia. I'm from, well, probably on behalf of Nuffield Australia this time. Um, my question is for John uh, on that EU. Um, I believe that you're, you got the friends across the channel um, are going through Brexit, and I believe they signed an agreement in April or something like that. How is that going to affect your um, EU agriculture policies and also... Um, there's also talks historically about the cap being removed from farmers in the and how's that going to affect the, uh, your farmers in, in your EU states? I, I didn't catch the second question. Could you repeat it? Uh, so uh, I'm probably aware that uh, there is a cap policy. Uh, um, was it a um, common agriculture policy in the EU? In EU the EU nations um, giving fair subsidies to farmers around the. Uh, uh, eastern states, eastern countries. Just wondering, uh, I've been, when I was traveling through the eastern countries of um, uh, Czech Republic and Poland during my Nuffield scholarship, there was talks about the cap well, policy um, being removed from those countries and, and, and it, it's gonna not help the farmers or something like that. And I was just wondering, what's your, do you know anything about it? And, and is that gonna change subsidies for them? Okay, thanks very much. Um, on your first question, well, the, the UK withdrawal from the European Union, uh, the, the main impact of that is going to be on the uh, European Union budget, including the, the budget for uh, agriculture. So uh, the UK uh, uh, provides about 11% of the budget for the running of the EU. That money will no longer be available, so we'll have to uh, trim our uh, cloth uh, accordingly. Um, second possible consequence, but this is very speculative, if over time, uh, the, the UK uh, takes a different regulatory approach uh, to, to the, uh, the approach being taken by the EU in terms of um, uh, uh, farming and food uh, health and safety standards, then I think we will see um, some, some trade barriers arising in, in, in trade across the, across the English Channel. But that is very speculative. On your second question, uh, no, there is no uh, 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 case or, or intention or expectation that um, the, the common agricultural policy or, and its next version will in some ways um, be, be uh, negative or, or inimical to the uh, interests of the uh, poorer uh, Central and Eastern European um, countries. Uh, they, they are net uh, beneficiaries of, um, of agricultural support. Their farmers get uh, um, quite a lot of uh, income support. Uh, from, from the cap, and that will continue. And I think we will see in the next uh, reform of the Common Agricultural Policy um, even greater uh, redistribution of the, of the money uh, to those uh, farmers uh, in, the, in, in the poorer uh, parts of Europe. Do we have another question? So, John, which of the four elements do you see will gain importance in the EU over the next five to ten years and worldwide? I think it's, it's inevitably it's um, uh, food, uh, food safety uh, because that is, that is fundamental for, for people. We, are, we have to eat, 
uh, we, we need to be sure that our food is, is safe. Um, and um, uh, as, as more and more uh, parts of the world um, uh, grow in prosperity, uh, safe uh, food becomes a, a much more pressing uh, priority for them. So I think that's going to be the, uh, the, the, the key issue uh, around the world in the, in the, in the coming decades. Ireland, you'd probably agree China's already taken that step. <clears throat> yeah, but I think even more important is food security. I think it's a much bigger issue than the world is. <coughs> we, we talked about the book, uh, Who Will Feed China? So China has feed, uh, fed themselves for um, 30 years, or even after they joined the WTO, everyone expected them to import much more, and they haven't really uh, stayed quite so self-sufficient. But that is changing. Now the question is, where are they getting their food from? And China is not the only one. India is coming. Indonesia. All over Asia, they're hungry. They want to eat more. Who is going to feed them? I think that, obviously, food safety is big, but food security should not be uh, neglected. We have a question here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Peter Corish, family farmer from Gundawindi in Queensland, also a board member of Infrastructure Australia. My question is to Erland. Uh, yesterday we, we heard that the uh, Belt and Roads strategy in, the China, in, in China would be potentially uh, quite negative in regard to access for Australian producers, and yet you put a slightly different slant on it uh, this morning in your presentation. I was wondering whether you could perhaps expand a little bit on, on your comment and your views in that regard, please. Yeah, so Belt and Road, they call it an initiative. I think, what, what is it? Well, it is about solving these fundamental problems in both China's security, but I think also global security. I think it is about food security. It is about the environment. It is about sustainability. Um, and China don't necessarily have the answers to this, but they're really pushing this now pushing it beyond their borders. Um, they have no experience in doing that. They haven't done it before. They were used to be very closed. They have very few international experts in China. They speak poor English. Um, so they have many issues. So I think uh, we still see a it's, a, it's a very early days of that initiative. But the issue is to solve some fundamental problems. And they realize more than any, and you know, they realize more than any that they are not sustainable and they need to do something now Otherwise, they will have massive problems in the future. The, the China story comes across as a country who are very, you know, they, they believe in themselves and they, they well, they, they pretend they are self-sufficient. The truth is that they really are aware of that, that they are not. Uh, and I think that we, we published an, um, an article a few weeks ago called The Seven Chinas. And we say that, well, the self-sufficient uh, China is the first China. It's the most powerful narrative that China is telling about itself. When we point out to them, but you're not self-sufficient, you, you know, your soybean uh, in, uh, increase, import increased 14% um, last year. Barley went up 77%. Um, wheat went up 44%, I think. You're not self-sufficient. Oh, but we are the most humiliated nation in the world. You foreigners attacked us 200 years ago. Okay, but you know that doesn't help. And then they, we have seven stories like that that China uses to defend themselves, and it looks like they are smart. And but the the, the bottom line is that they, you know, it, these are words. This is rhetoric. And when it comes to reality, it is that China is not that rich per capita. They don't have these resources. So they have issues, and they're now trying to create an initiative where they can solve their problem and global problems. Must that answer to your question, maybe? <laughs> we have a question up here. Thank you, everyone. Jared Greenville from the OECD. Um, very good presentations, very interesting. Um, lots of questions, but I'll just ask one um, to Raina about Indonesia. Um, it's an area that we have worked on. You quoted some numbers over the last while. Um, what staggers me is that there's a lack of consumer voice in, in Indonesia. You pointed to these large costs. Um, I was just wondering, with moves also to move to restrict further soybeans, a uh, protein source for, for households, is there any push now from consumers to, to push back against these policies, um, to see some pressure to come off prices? Um, and if so, do you think that, when would that occur? 
Yeah, <clears throat> unfortunately, very easy answer, no. <laughs> there is no um, consumer voice. We are engaging with the National Consumer Association. They were quite hesitant at the beginning to take this issue up. They are very much into food safety, so these issues that they are picking up, but prices that are artificially high due to trade policies, etc., they, they also don't dare touching. Um, somehow, self-sufficiency is a very sensitive uh, topic in the country. It's the holy cow, so to speak, so a lot of people shy away from addressing this, and the consumer groups are similar. But I think we're making inroads. So, number one, we got the Consumer Association as a coalition partner, so we're starting a, a project, which is a website, basically, which we call Hak Ma'mur. Uh, Ma'mur means to prosper. Um, it's an Arab word, but Ma'mur we take as an abbreviation of Makanan Murah, which also means uh, cheap food. So the right to prosper is the right to cheap food. And uh, this, we have them as a coalition partner, we try to get the World Food Program, which says uh, quite clearly, two-thirds of Indonesian farmers are net consumers of food. They are badly affected by food prices themselves, even as farmers. So more groups are coming and jumping on the bandwagon. And uh, we are trying to make this more about nutrition now, um, because uh, if we talk about undernourished children, if we talk about the effects on people, that moves more and it actually allows us to make our case even more. But we really are pushing other groups to adopt the issue. So far there is not yet a strong movement, unfortunately. Yes, I think there's another question up here. Rosemary Lott from ABES and my question is for Erlen Eck. Um, could you elaborate a bit more about China's policy about in, uh, increasing the emphasis on quality rather than quantity? Um, in particular, the um, trade-offs between intensification and extensification and um, environmental management or env environmental performance of that production and then also perhaps um, the social implications of that change. Okay, um, yeah, so that's um, at really at the core of the transition uh, and the strat new strategy for China is to focus on quality more than quantity. Five years ago, they changed to say that they were equally important. At the recent party congress in October, for the first time, they said quality is more important than quantity. What does quality mean, though? <laughs> Uh, well, I can talk a bit about the strategy, and we, uh, I think we're, um, one thing that should be mentioned is if they don't focus on quality, something will happen with food prices, or something is happening with food prices. Why do China and Indonesia have the cost for agriculture production is much higher than global prices? This is a big problem. Um, and, and the reason for that, part of the reason, is that China produces too much, they, where the market doesn't really you know, they're not appreciated, they, they, they want to pay that price. Um, so they should produce less. Um, in agriculture, what Xi Jinping did, uh, so they still talk about self-sufficiency, and the news, the global media get this story wrong, in that uh, they note that, oh, they still say self-sufficiency, but you need to look at the third word, which is self-sufficiency capacity. So this is a new thing. They've added a word, self-sufficiency capacity. Well, that means that they have the ability to feed the people, but in peace times, they should let the market run it. They should not interfere. If the prices, however, fluctuate, the government will intervene. So they're creating now a mechanism of a new, a new relationship between the market and the government. Now, the government will be, become a much bigger regulator. Um, setting much higher standards, environment, um, they will um, use their uh, national reserves more actively according to a functional futures market, a commodity market, which will be international. I, uh, I suspect that uh, if you want to trade with China in the future, you will not discuss the prices in dollar value, but in RMB, that's a natural and this will be, the government will support setting up these new institutions. And they're coming probably sooner than what you expect. And it's going to affect, well, value. Um, these standards we talk about, what are the new standards for digital trade, e-commerce? Um, 
what information do you need to give to these platforms or the consumers? And the government uh, will be the regulators of this, and that's what they mean with quality. It's more regulation, more government presence, but not in the actual uh, deal. <laughs> Managing the price, sustainability, uh, and satisfaction from the people. So Australia still plays that role of supplying quality as opposed to quantity because the Chinese could eat for breakfast what we produce in blueberries. So there is Australia's role um, and that will be evident then in the expo to come in November. Can you talk us through just a tiny bit about you know what, what Australian exporters and the government assistance maybe um, should be doing at that consumer expo? Yeah, so the, this expo is quite remarkable. China has a big expo already called the Canton Fair in Guangzhou. Uh, it's the biggest expo in the world. It lasts for many weeks, it's twice a year. And it's all about China exporting. And China is the world factory. Now, they've changed the policy, so they need a new expo. <laughs> and it's all about import. So Chinese producers are not allowed to display at this expo. And the government is putting together, going to all the provinces, provincial government are now putting together what they call squads of buyers. 160,000 have been called on to go to Shanghai for five days and sign deals. What are they looking for? That's the thing here. Because China is going to import. It doesn't mean that the gate is open for sure. <laughs> and there are going to be rules on how this trade is going to be conducted. Um, we were having a chat over dinner yesterday, I think it's really at the core of the question here, who, who can add value? Are China looking for processed food, for instance, or are they actually only looking for commodities? Who knows? I would suspect that they want commodities a lot, maybe not to your finished products. That might be an issue. Are you okay with that? Well, um, do you have any choice? Are there any other alternatives, maybe? Maybe you should diversify, think about others. And, and that's why I mentioned this capacity cooperation, because, well, you can team up with China. They do have a, a market. I think this is also maybe Indonesia's kind of strategy. You mentioned that um, they want to trade. So they want to import and export. And this is also what China wants. They want to, what they, they call I call it balanced trade. I'm, I'm thinking, is that exactly the same as trade balance? So they go zero. But there is heavy discussion in China at the moment saying that China should run trade deficits. There's no, why, why shouldn't you run trade deficits? It's not an economic problem, as long as you can manage it. How do you manage it? Well, you need to look after your credit, creditors. Top uh, Chinese uh, official on the economy was in Washington last week discussing the US well, China's US biggest creditor. So they were discussing the terms of their new loans. Well, as long as you can manage China, that's fine. If China get pissed off, which uh, if Trump is pushing this too far, well, they will say, pay us back. <laughs> well, I might ask it to divert a bit because when you talk about safe food and perceptions and regulation, w uh, we think of an example is the widely used herbicide glyphosate. So John Clark, Talk us through um, where we might be in five years' time. There is the parliament in the EU voted um, for a phase-out of glyphosate, but the European Commission went on the balance of science and said we'll relicense it. So where will we be in five years, and where will that leave Australia? Well, glyphosate, as you, as you probably know, is the world's most favourite um, herbicide used in, in, in cereal production. I think it's a very good example of the, um, the challenges in, in, in reconciling science with public opinion in, in, in a democratic society. And that's, what's, that's what's been in the, the debate in, in, in Europe. Uh, we, we have a lot of studies, um, independent ones, which showed that uh, glyphosate is, is safe, is not carcinogenic. Fine. There was one important minority study which suggested it could be carcinogenic. And for that reason, there was a very strong public opinion uh, uh, against the continued use of, of, of glyphosate in, uh, in European uh, cereal um, production. The compromise that we, uh, we um, landed on was to uh, co continue to authorize the use of glyphosate for five more years and to use that time 
to carry out more scientific studies, to have a more definitive uh, scientific view, and also to, to allow um, uh, companies to, to develop new products that could uh, eventually replace glyphosate if uh, after five years we, we definitively concluded it was uh, a, a health and safety risk. Behind all this, I think there's a, there's a you know, public distrust of, of science, um, a feeling that a lot of the scientific studies are actually um, driven by um, multinational companies who have vested interest. That may or may not be correct. And also because science is, is, is constantly changing its views. You know, a year ago, uh, we were told that butter is very bad for you. Now we're told this year that butter is very good for you. So, you know, how does, how does the public, how do consumers actually um, react when, when faced with uh, conflicting and changing scientific opinion? So that, that I think, is, is, is where we are with glyphosate. And we will see in, in two, three years' time whether we have more... Uh, more um, definitive scientific evidence on its safety or otherwise. You know, but the other thing that I think is, is important to, 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 to point out is that uh, our um, restrictions on uh, the use of this uh, of herbicide or other products, you know, it's not protectionism. It's almost the opposite. Uh, European farmers are very unhappy at the thought they may have to stop using glyphosate. Uh, because they'll have to then uh, use more expensive products. Uh, whereas uh, um, imports from Australia, from uh, Latin America, soya and wheat and maize and so on, you know, can continue to use uh, glyphosate in production, provided it doesn't have any residue traces in the imported product. So our own farmers are at a competitive disadvantage uh, thanks to the regulatory decisions we take. So it's actually, there is no protectionism behind some of the decisions we make about the, the use uh, of a certain production methods or, or, or products. Are there questions from the floor? We still have... Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I missed you there. Karen. Mary Bennett from AgriGrowth Tasmania. Um, my question's uh, for John. Um, you talked about the um, things like climate change and factors that are really important to taxpayers in the EU and that they're willing to um, subsidise farmers uh, to, to meet um, those requirements. You also highlighted poverty as a, a, a key issue for um, residents of the EU and that's clear in a lot of your policies. I'm just wondering, is there any narrative within the EU about how um, subsidising the farmers impacts exporters in emerging and developing countries? It doesn't impact on developing countries uh, at all. Uh, our, our um, what you call subsidies, uh, uh, I would call um, uh, an investment in public goods. This is, this is uh, income support delinked from prices and production. It's completely delinked from uh, 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 trade uh, aimed essentially at helping f farmers to uh, meet the, the very, very high cost of, of, of meeting very, very stringent environmental climate change, animal welfare and, and food safety requirements. That, that is what the, uh, the, the public money goes to. It also goes to um, uh, helping farmers to um, provide the public good of maintaining landscapes and, and, and ensuring that the, the countryside remains somewhere uh, viable and attractive to uh, live in. Our agricultural policy is not only about um, productivity uh, or um, uh, meeting uh, sustainable, uh, sustainability goals, it's also about preserving the rural fabric. We don't want a, a Europe where everybody lives in cities. We want a Europe where half the population can still live in the rural areas with quality of life. And so the, the support for farmers, which is very, very fully supported by the European taxpayer, goes to those uh, goals. And um, there have been many attempts to, to uh, in the last few years to, to, to show that uh, our agricultural policies or production has a, dem has a damaging effect in, on developing countries. It's absolute nonsense. Tw tw 20 years ago, yes, perhaps, when we were um, giving export subsidies uh, for uh, milk powder, for pork, for poultry and so on. That's all a thing of the past. And I think, uh, I, ho I hope Australia realises that our, our policies have changed completely. We are the world's biggest importer uh, from the least developed countries. And, uh, you know, our, our uh, agriculture is very complementary uh, to those countries. 
I, I can add that China is learning from the EU and the support policy. <laughs> China has reached their amber box in many of, the, of their products and they're looking, hey, EU used to do this and they have changed and they support very differently. And that's the support goes to the land and goes to irrigation and it goes to well, the public good or... I'm very interested in caged eggs at the moment. It's the debate that's very hot. So in Europe, you've gone away from um, caging layer hens. And um, I wonder how Asia will follow suit, given that Europe sets the standard. So perhaps Indonesia's perspective and China's perspective. <coughs> so for intensive animal welfare production, I think there was a question about intensive and extensive, um, drilling down into some of the livestock production systems. What do you think? So, unfortunately, Indonesia is relatively insulated and not so much exposed to international experiences. Um, obviously, uh, animal welfare in Indonesia is not yet a big issue. I mean, Australia has experienced this very much yes. domestically, <clears throat> especially 2011. Um, I wish it was more the case. I do believe there is a growing middle class, and I think the growing middle class gets more and more concerned with food safety. So similar to what's happened in China, it took, it took a while for people to, to grow their wealth to be able to afford things, like in the European Union, the same thing. Um, in China, we had the help of a couple of terrible scandals and horrible scenarios that made people very much aware. Um, Indonesia hasn't had that yet, these terrible scandals which would mobilize everybody. So I believe the, uh, the production is not yet as influenced um, by public opinion, by reports, etc., as it should be. Uh, just a quick response to the earlier yes. discussion. Um, <coughs> what, whenever we talk about more open trade, we're always facing the big argument, so what about China? I mean, and that's not just in Indonesia. The Indians have the same kind of discussion. If you open our markets, the Chinese will dump all their products and will call, kill our, all our industries. And that's why the solution is China. And that's what China has realized. They're saying 2015, 2016, global trade went a lot down. Then they came together and said, this, this is hurting us. What is the solution? Oh, we are the part of the problem. We need to import more. Yeah. And... Um, we have a similar issue when it comes to the farm products from the European Union, even though you say it's nonsense and they are not subsidized, but it's perceived as product coming from farms that are supported by taxpayers' money. And so Indonesia is also reluctant to opening up because of that impression, that image that, Indone that European farmers are so, so, so strongly supported. And uh, I just had a meeting here with farmers uh, two days ago and it's quite refreshing for somebody like me to talk to the farmers here who are very much against uh, state subsidies, government subsidies. And I had the same experience in New Zealand when they say we are strong because we are independent of government support, largely. And that would be very different if you, I'm German by origin, if you spoke to German farmers, they would say we are still strong because we do get government support. And that's a nice difference that I experience here. We have a question from before. Yeah, Greg Harper from University of Melbourne Commercial. It, it's really for Rana, but happy to hear other comments as well. I was interested in your comments about massive online open courses, and you, you ran past that relatively quickly. I w just wanted to know your view on how effective they are at communicating to consumer groups, farmer groups about, um, you know, uh, world food policy issues and trade issues, and perhaps as an advocacy tool. Yeah. Um, consumer groups, yes. Uh, farmers groups, maybe not so much. It depends on the internet penetration in the country, but it wouldn't reach the real rural communities. But we do it because we want to reach mostly university students in the universities to be exposed to other ideas, to the set, to understand the consequences of t uh, food trade protectionism as it is at the moment. Um, we have very good experiences with this. We run this course. We have had 2,000 participants. They are in more than 60 cities all across the country. We have cooperation with universities in Papua and Aceh. So it's really like from west to east. A lot of um, groups participating. And we measure, we do surveys, we measure, and we see that people understand, start to understand the difference between food security and food self-sufficiency because most people still think it's the same thing. Self-sufficient means secure. 
Uh, so people start to understand there's a difference. People start to understand that the farmers are not benefiting from the self-sufficiency policy. So we have survey results that show the before and after how people are actually starting to adopt these ideas. So I do believe it's an, is a, is a, is an advocacy tool that works very well, given all the other constraints. We only have about six or seven universities of sufficient standard in the country. All the other universities are really not at that standard. So they need these kind of online courses so that they can actually use them in their classes uh, to get uh, this quality content to their own students. And they're quite willing, not all, but some of them are really quite willing to, to, to introduce our courses to their classes. Um, just perhaps finally, in the final couple of minutes, uh, John Clark, what do you think uh, Australian producers should pay more attention to when exporting to the EU and, and bearing in mind we're driving towards a, a free trade agreement? I, I've uh, had a number of meetings with um, Australian uh, agricultural stakeholders, federations, and, and one of my messages to them has been, um, you know, the, Europe uh, looks for uh, high quality products. Uh, products with a very, very good environmental and sustainability footprint, uh, uh, produced to very high uh, animal welfare uh, standards. You know, so I think the, the, to the extent that Australia, and I think it can, uh, can, can meet those, um, those requirements, those standards, to the extent that Australia can, if you like, decommoditize its, uh, its products for export to Europe and move up the quality and value chain, I think that will be uh, very positive. Uh, for uh, the future FTA. I think there's a very, very good market in Europe for Australian uh, agricultural and food products, and, but it, it, it does need that um, uh, additional um, uh, quality and, and value-adding dimension to be really successful. Well, I'd like to um, draw the session to a close, but thank you very much for all of your very insightful comments. It seems that food security is the key driver, but food safety is close on its heels, and Australia can't really provide quantity, but certainly quality, and I think you've guided us in um, where Australia can fit with China, with uh, Europe, and with Indonesia. So thank the panel very much.